Okay, it's 1034, so I will go ahead and start now. So good morning, everybody. I'm Alejandro Huerta, Program Director at Enterprise Community Partners. Today's webinar will give you an overview of the role of public partners in the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Grant Program. I'll be co-presenting with my coworker, Christine, who will introduce herself later. Before we begin, let's go over some housekeeping items. First, all attendees have been muted. If you have questions as we go along, you can enter them into the chat box. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll, you'll see the chat icon. Your questions can view, be, be viewed by everyone. My coworker, Julia, will respond to the questions that come up. She will do her best to answer your questions, but we will be saving time at the end to answer any outstanding questions. We will also compile a Q&A document following today's webinar that we'll send out. Our emails will be at the end of this presentation if you have any follow-up questions. Now let's go ahead and get started. So here's the agenda for today. As you can see, during this webinar, you'll learn what the roles of public partners are in helping to create a competitive ASIC application. Specifically, you'll learn what public partners can do to help contribute to an application's pedestrian, bicycle, and transit scope. Before moving on, let's thank the Strategic Growth Council for sponsoring today's webinar. And I should note that we'll also provide their contact at the end of this presentation. So a little bit about who we are. So Enterprise Community Partners, if you don't know us already, is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to connecting households to opportunity through supporting affordable housing development. Enterprise has provided ASIC technical assistance to applicant teams across the state since the program's inception. We've done so through private contracts and through the state's free technical assistance program. With full-time staff dedicated to ASIC year-round, we've successfully helped many applicants throughout the state get awarded ASIC funding. This year, we're part of a statewide TA team that provides technical assistance on behalf of the state. I'll let you know who is on the TA team on the next slide. So each year, SGC contracts with technical assistance providers to offer focused TA to qualified applicants. In round four of the program, for example, 19 TA-assisted program projects wound up submitting and 14 were successful in obtaining ASIC funding. These are the organizations on this slide contracting with SGC right now alongside with us, Enterprise, to provide ASIC technical assistance throughout the state. Each organization has a specific specialty and some of, the, some of them will be presenting other webinars in a second webinar series, which I'll show you in a sec. This is the schedule of all, this, of all the ASIC webinars we have planned. This webinar in particular is the last of a series of introductory webinars. The second set of webinars in June will teach you the details of specific ASIC application topics that are often the most challenging. Specifically, our TA team member, Estelano Advisors, will lead you through a community engagement webinar, while Raymond Associates will cover the GHG webinar, and California Relief and Climate Resolve will co-present the Climate Adaptation, Air Pollution, and Urban Greening webinar. Please, please contact me if you'd like to sign up if you haven't already to any of these. Great. So now let's jump into a quick review of the AHSC program, or as we like to call it, ASIC. If you weren't able to join our ASIC 101 webinar, let us know and we can send you the recording of that webinar as well as the PowerPoint. But to begin with, let's paint a big picture. So ASIC is a unique program that requires collaboration between housing developers, transit agencies, local governments, and community organizations. The overall purpose of the ASIC program is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through projects that implement land use, housing, transportation, and agricultural land preservation practices to support infill 
and compact development. Fundamentally, AHSC is one of many of California's suite of cap and trade programs, also known as California Climate Investment Programs, or CCI. The program receives its revenue from quarterly auctions where pollution allowances are purchased. The revenue generated from those allowances is then funneled into the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and from there into CCI programs like ASIC. At its core then, the ASIC program is a greenhouse gas reduction program. This program funds projects designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through a reduction of vehicle miles traveled. Keep in mind that, keep that in mind when thinking about what makes an ASIC application competitive. Lastly, as shown on this slide, the ASIC program funds both housing and sustainable transportation projects. And in fact, most of the winning applications include both components. Okay, now let's review award amounts. The maximum request for an ASIC application in round five, which is the round that just passed, was $30 million. And you'll note that this was a significant increase from what was allowed in round four, which was $20 million per ASIC application. You must request at least $1 million to apply to ASIC. The average request was $22 million in round five across all projects in the state. In a bit, I'll let you know how much money there will be in round six, but first I'll show you how an application is broken up into the different funding buckets. So here on this slide, you'll see the average breakdown of how an ASIC request was broken down in round five. As you can see, divided between the housing loan and the grants for transportation projects and the program component. There are two requirements that you must keep in mind for how you allocate your ASIC budget. One is that at least 50% of your total requests must be spent on the housing piece. Second, you are capped at $10 million for both of the STI or TRA, which I'll go into a little bit later, or in other words, your transportation improvement costs. As you can see, Across the applications in round five, more than 50% of the total requests on any given application was allocated for housing, and the remainder went to the transportation and program components of the application. Again, these are averages, so your specific application ask may be different. Through ASIC's four rounds thus far, more than $1 billion have been invested in housing and tra transportation improvements throughout the state. And I'll note really quickly that the next awards will be announced on June 25th. So that's kind of coming up fairly quickly. As I discussed earlier, the maximum award amount increased from $20 million to $30 million between round four and round five. We are not sure right now what the max award will be in round six. You'll see here that the NOFA amount in round five, five was $550 million. Right now, the round six NOFA has at least $375 million available, but you'll note that there is one more auction to go before the final NOFA amount is determined, so stay tuned. Before I launch into the roles of public partners, let me first identify who some eligible public partner applicants are. Most of the time, an ASIC application will have the locality sign, in, sign on as a joint applicant. For example, cities or counties can be joint applicants with the developers. In Los Angeles, for instance, the county signs onto projects in unincorporated areas, while the city of LA signs onto applications within the city limits. Housing authorities can also be an eligible applicant, and sometimes they are joint applicants. There are other public partners like school districts and transit, and transit agencies, which I've listed here. If you weren't able to join the ASIC 101 webinar, it's important to note that not all public partners have to be joint applicants. Most localities are, for instance, while public housing authorities are less so. Transit agencies are rarely joint applicants. 
I'll go into detail a little bit, bit later about what a joint applicant actually means. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to the roles of public partners. The key players on an ASIC application, as you can see here on this slide, are the housing developer, community-based organizations and public partners, whether local governments, housing authorities, or transit partners. And success on an ASIC application requires partnerships between all of these folks. Typically, the housing developer drives the application, while a community-based organization, or CBO, helps identify community needs. Public partners also help in two, day, in two different ways. First, localities help identify the bicycle and pedestrian scope on an ASIC application. Second, transit partners identify the transit component as part of the GHG scoring section on the application. Obviously, public partners are also involved in identifying community, need, community needs, but I want to focus on the bike, ped, and transit scope in this webinar. Before we launch into the specifics of the bike, pad, and transit scope, let me review another critical role of the public partners. Specifically, local governments are responsible for helping housing developers achieve several key thresholds of the ASIC guidelines. Some of them you'll see here on this slide. First, a housing development needs all land use approvals by the time of application. So for example, for round six, that, this would mean that you would need to have all land use approvals by February 2021. Local governments can help expedite the local, approvement, uh, the local approvals if necessary to help meet the deadline. Planning departments can also help build in incentives in the land use approval request that can help improve the competitiveness of an ASIC application. For example, Density bonus incentives or limited parking ratios can help increase the GHG competitiveness of an ASIC application. In addition, demonstration of site control for the housing development is also required, and this includes things like ENAs and DDAs as proof of site control. Obviously, if a locality has land that the developer wishes to build on, then this will require close coordination with the public partners to ensure site control and that land use approvals are obtained. The public partners responsible for implementing the bicycle and pedestrian improvements will also be responsible for having site control. Thirdly, as you can see here, the housing development requires environmental clearance such as sequel by the application deadline. All applicable time periods for filing appeals or lawsuits, lawsuits must have lapsed within 30 days of the application due date. You'll note that NEPA clearance is also required for the housing development if the developer is seeking federal funds. Again, public partners are very important because they can help expedite the CEQA clearance, especially if planning departments can utilize CEQA exemptions or CEQA streamlining for infill affordable projects. Transportation projects are not, are not held to the same environmental clearance threshold timeline, so just be very aware of that. Uh, for the transportation projects, these clearances are actually required by grant dispersal. Okay, so now I'll move on to some other critical ASIC guideline threshold requirements that will impact whether or not you can actually apply in any given round. Um, and these are related to whether or not you're ready to go. So, for both the housing and the transportation scope, ASIC can only fund projects that have not started construction. So keep that in mind. And regarding completion times, ASIC requires that the housing development be completed no more than five years from the signing of a standard agreement. Note, however, that there are extensions possible. Transportation projects typically also should be completed within that general time frame. But again, uh, you would defer to the terms of the standard agreement. Okay, so next we'll talk about another readiness requirement that the project, which is that the project must demonstrate a level of committed funding at time of application of at least 90%. Keep in mind that historically applicants have been able to count the financing through 4% tax credits as part of the enforceable funding commitment. 
ASIC funding can also be counted as committed. Furthermore, you'll be able to factor in any committed funding in this application from the transportation projects. Second, a very important role of public agencies at that is that they are eligible applicants on an ASIC application. If the public agency has a real property interest in the proposed project, the application must include the public agency as a joint applicant or include a commitment to enter into a contractual agreement to develop the project if awarded. Joint applicants will be held jointly and severally liable for the completion of the project. Most ASIC applications in our experience include the housing developer and the local government as joint applicants on the ASIC application. All joint applicants must submit a resolution, so keep that in mind in your timeline if your city council or board of supervisor has, has a busy schedule. Transportation agencies sometimes ask if they have to be joint applicants. The answer is no. A transit agency may be a non-applicant. In this case, an executed agreement with a transportation agency may, prov may be provided for the completion of their components of the ASIC application. Okay. So now we'll discuss what ASIC actually funds. I'll focus on the eligible costs for public partners. The first cost category is the Sustainable Transportation Infrastructure or STI category. These are items like sidewalks, bike lanes, transit vehicles, or transit capital improvements that facilitate mode shift. In other words, instead of driving, you will walk or bike or take public transit. New to the STI category in round five was the addition of transit operations for service expansion for up to two years. These STI projects, because they're in the public right away, are typically implemented by public agencies. STI projects will fund, will be provided, sorry, let me start again. STI project funds will be provided as grants and paid out as reimbursements. Next up, we have TRAs or transit related amenities. I always describe these items as ones that enhance the use of the STI items or things that improve the experience for bicyclists, pedestrians, or transit riders. For example, street trees, bus shelters, bicycle parking, street lighting, bus benches. Again, these are usually managed by the public agency partner. Finally, Programs are also eligible costs. ASIC will fund operating expenses for up to three years for programs, up to $500,000. In addition, ASIC requires that at least one transit pass per residential unit be provided to residents of the affordable housing development for three years. You can use ASIC to cover this cost. I'll give you examples of other programs in a little bit. Now, let me give you some examples of the STI eligible cost category. Notice that eligible costs include active transportation improvements as well as new public transit improvements. For most cities, this category helps to implement facilities identified in bicycle master plans or mobility elements of the general plan, for example. In particular, Complete streets can be implemented using ASIC to construct or upgrade bikeways and build or improve sidewalks with traffic calming measures. As I mentioned previously, transit partners can also utilize ASIC grants to help procure transit vehicles or build capital improvements projects or pay for transit operations. For example, transit partners have used ASIC to help fund BRT infrastructure, procure zero electric vehicle or ZEV buses, and help pay for operations on newly expanded lines. Localities and transit agencies use this STI category most on an ASIC application. Okay, now let me move on to the TRA category. This is a broad category that includes streetca streetscape improvements like street lighting or signage or street furniture. Transit partners have also partnered on ASIC applications to request ASIC grants for bike infrastructure, such as bike repair kiosks. 
Transit agencies have also request, requested ASIC funds to improve existing transit stations. Before I move on to the final cost category, let me remind you, as I said earlier, that each application is capped at $10 million for the combined STI and TRS, TRA ask. Bear that in mind because you will have to negotiate with the applicants and partners to figure out how much of the total ask goes to what STI and TRA improvements in order to stay under the cap while maximizing your points. Finally, you'll note that urban greening is listed here. Urban greening can include urban street canopy, green alleys, drought tolerant landscaping, community gardens, and can actually fit in either the STI or TRA categories. The last eligible cost category that could also apply to public partners is the program category. These are some examples, bicycle and pedestrian safety classes, which can be implemented by a local community group or an MPO. In addition to the minimum three years that are required as part of an ASIC application, applicants sometimes partner with transit agencies to make transit passes available to the community as well as to the residents of the proposed affordable housing development. Less used are community air pollution mitigation measures, programs, but workforce development programs are popular if a local public agency has a workforce development department. You could also use ASIC to help fund car share programs. Now, let's get to the money. In this section of the presentation, I'll walk you through the budget process that is, that is most relevant to the public partners. That is, funding for the active transportation and transit components. Before I move on here, I just wanted to make it very clear that those slides where I showed examples of STI, TRA, and programs are just examples and they're not the comprehensive list of all the possible types of projects that could be covered under those cost categories. So now let's talk about the transportation budget. So step one here for public partners to consider on an ASIC application is how much grant money could be available to them if a housing developer is interested in applying. The transportation budget will depend on how much the housing developer is asking for. In other words, the requested loan for their housing, affordable housing development helps determine the total cost. Let's go through this example together. Say a developer is asking for $13.7 million for their affordable housing development loan. You'll note that we have put it in here as the acronym AHD. Let's assume then that the program cost requires $300,000. And remember that the max for programs is 500,000. So that leaves us with a total ask right now of $14 million but that leaves out the STI and TRA costs for the transportation improvements. You will want to include STI and TRA costs in your application because they contribute points on the application, which I'll explain next. Specifically, you get points based on what percentage of your total ASIC ask comes from the STI and TRA categories. As shown in parentheses here, you can max out on points on the application if you spend at least 25% 20, of your total requests on, e on STIs. Similarly, you get max points if you spend at least 5% of the total requests on TRAs at transit stops. Remember, these are minimums for maximum points. In other words, you can spend less but won't get the max points. On the other hand, you can spend more than the 25% and 5% as long as you don't exceed the $10 million STI and TRA cap. So going back to this example, so you have $3.7 million for the housing loan, $5 million for the STI ask, and $1 million for the TRA, plus the 300,000 for the program costs. So here, you would have a total ask of $20 million. This proposed budget meets the ASA guidelines that at least 50% of the total ask go toward the housing development. And at the same time, the combined STI and TRA ask are below the $10 million cap. This is a theoretical budget on an ASIC application, 
but I wanted to give you a sense of how much funds per cost categories could be available on the competitive ASIC application and how much of those funds could go toward the public partners for the STI and TRA improvements. Okay, so one last thing about the transportation budget that's important to public partners. When budgeting for STI and TRA improvements, you can also use ASIC to pay for soft costs like planning, engineering, construction management, architectural other, or other design work, et cetera. For STI projects, soft costs shall not exceed 30% of the total ASIC award, while for TRA projects, soft costs shall not exceed 10% of the total award. Public partners can, can also use ASIC to pay for active delivery costs, meaning staff costs incurred by the public agency that are directly related to implementing specific capital projects or program costs. They may include project document preparation, for example, or project underwriting, or construction management, inspections, or reporting to the department. Note that active delivery costs shall not, not exceed 10% of the costs associated with STI and TRA projects. Don't forget that you can include these soft costs on your ASIC application. So what is the responsibility of the public partner if they contribute improvements to the ASIC application? The public partners will provide budget information and oftentimes fill out the transportation sections of the application itself. Basically, this boils down to providing a basic project description of the STI TRAO program components. Just to give you an example, a local department of public works would describe a proposed bike lane and would provide the distance measurement of that bike lane. And the description on the ASIC application would be short, no more than one, more, no more than one paragraph. Public partners often ask what level of detail is required for the budgets in the ASIC application. The answer is you're expected to fill out a rough budget with general light items for each of the items, but you're not expected to drill down into the specific details. Don't forget that you can also put other committed funds, if any, on the ASIC application as leverage. Third, the public partner has to provide evidence of two past projects of similar scope com completed within the last 10 years. This requirement ensures that the public partners have the necessary experience to implement those components if awarded. Okay, so I'm gonna move on, uh, and I think I'm gonna take it over actually from Christine because she's having audio problems, and I'll describe some strategies for maximizing points. So hopefully you've gotten a sense so far of what public partners can use ASIC for and what you're responsible for doing on the application itself. Great. So we're gonna look at what's expected of public agencies when considering the development of the transportation scope for an ASIC application. Public agencies and transit agencies are critical to ensuring a competitive ASIC application. As we'll see, well over a majority of the 100 possible points on this application are directly tied in some way to non-housing scoping components. On this slide, you'll see a partial overview of the program scoring rubric. Again, there are 100 total, total points possible on an ASIC application. Keep in mind though, that this program is not like other state housing programs in that no applicant has ever achieved a one, full 100 points. That being said, you do want to shoot for the highest score on your application so your project can be successful. The largest section where most points are available is called the quantitative policy section. Here you can achieve up to 55 points. Items in orange text on this slide are linked in some way or another to the transit and active transportation scope. Okay, so let's dig into some of the details of the actual points related to some of the bicycle and pedestrian improvements. Let's start with bike improvements. ASIC scores on both the quantity and quality of bike infrastructure a project proposals, proposes. Full points are awarded if your scope includes at least a half mile of what are called context-sensitive bikeways. 
Context sensitivity is a definition the ASIC program uses to ensure that the type of bikeway being proposed is appropriate for both existing road volume and speed limits. The next point section related to bike infrastructure relates to network connectivity. If your project, either through proposed or existing bikeways, runs within a quarter mile of either the affordable housing development or your qualifying transit stop, you'll get the full points awarded for that section. The final two points available have to do with safe bicycle access. Here, a public agency will need to verify that the proposed improvements address at least two specific access or network barriers. This list is provided by the program and includes things like improving sight distance and visibility and the elimination of potential conflict points. The scoring section for the pedestrian improvement section largely mirrors the structure we, we just reviewed for the bike points. Full points are available for, how, for developing at least 2,000 linear feet of what the program defines as safe and accessible walkways. A walkway meets this definition if it is composed of continuously paved ADA compliant sidewalks, which include marked pedestrian crossings at all, arter all arterial intersections, and includes comfort and safety attributes such as lighting and or shade canopy. An additional point is gained if you propose a scope that includes a pedestrian crossing point that, li that links two existing pedestrian networks that are currently unlinked for at least a quarter mile. Examples of this include overpasses and underpasses. You cannot count at grade improvements. Again, similar to the bike Scope. Two points are awarded if the public agency verifies at least two ways the proposed pedestrian uh, improvements are addressing existing pedestrian barriers. Okay, now we're going to move on to our favorite section, which is another scoring area that's heavily influenced by the transportation scope, specifically the GHG section. Up to 30 of the 100 points are directly attributable to the scale of the GHG reductions achieved by an ASIC project. This section is split up into two. 15 points relate to a project's total achieved GHG reductions. The other 15 points relate to the depth of reductions when compared to the size of a project's funding request, what the program refers to as GHG efficiency. There is an entirely separate webinar we'll be hosting in, G in June that digs into how GHG reductions work in detail later, in, as I said, in June. I recommend signing up for that webinar if you're interested in to dig into the details. But for now, let me just give you some pointers. So GHG reductions can be achieved in multiple ways, but there are some best practices you can rely on. An, a an ASIC applications housing project is a primary contributor to GHG reductions. To maximize these reductions, there are a couple of best practices to, to work on, in, including in your housing site. You should maximize your site's affordability, ensuring that at least a minimum of 20% of the affordable units, along with density, measured as units per acre and limiting the amount of on-site parking to at least a one-to-one -one ratio, ratio, but lower if you can. So these will help improve your GHG from your housing. Next, we'll focus on transportation improvements. So next to the, uh, this is the, the most significant scoping element as it relates to GHG reductions. The, e the key input considered when estimated GHG reductions is transit ridership. You want to scope for improvements that will considerably increase your ridership. Just be prepared to stand by the numbers of your project as the State Air Resources Board will verify all reduction estimates once applications are submitted. Finally, GHG reductions are attributed to substantive bike and pedestrian improvements. Though to be transparent, they contribute considerably less so on the GHG front than the housing and transit pieces. Okay, so let's look at how you develop a project area. So if you have a housing site in mind, how do you start thinking about the non-housing scope, i.e. the bike, ped, and transit? It's helpful to understand how the program defines this project area in order to start this conversation. So I'll take you through the steps. 
So first, you need to make sure your housing site qualifies for the program by ensuring that it is located at least half a mile from a qualifying transit stay stop. And qualifying transit at a minimum is publicly available service that, that departs at least twice during peak hours as defined by the transit agency. If you do not currently have qualifying transit, but wish to participate in the program, you can use ASIC to actually establish this service. Next, you draw a one mile buffer around the qualifying transit stop. This is what's called the initial project area where you can begin to start thinking about these scoping ideas. Here you can see we have both some bike and ped scope within the initial project area that are extending out beyond that original one mile buffer. We can reshape our project area to encompass the entirety of these improvements. We do that by drawing additional half mile buffers around those specific STI items. And then we merge them, which we've done here on this slide. This project area map is important because it's how application reviewers confirm some of your point and threshold requirements and also plays a role in GHG quantification. If you are concerned about your organization's mapping capacity, the TA team can help you connect with mapping providers. Before I move on to some case studies, I just wanted to note that the final project area, as you can see, is more than the original one mile and also this is important because it means that any of the STI and TRA improvements that a public partner wants should be within that project area. Okay, great. Now I'll move on to the case studies. So uh, these uh, case studies are going to highlight some examples um, in, of awarded projects. So let's move to the first case study here. So Light Tree Apartments is a 128 unit family affordable housing development in East Palo Alto that received an award amount in round four of the program. It was the highest scoring application and represents strong collaboration between multiple partners, including the city of East Palo Alto, Eden Housing, a community organization, East Palo Alto Community Alliance, and neighborhood organization and SAMTRANS. You'll note that some of the improvements included a point six miles of bikeways and 3,600 feet of pedestrian walkways and acquisition of three electric buses for a new limited stop express bus service operated by SAMTRANS. This project advances numerous land use, urban design and transportation goals in East Palo Alto's general and bicycle transportation plan and was designed with the ASIC program in mind. The, the summer prior to application submittal, the County of San Mateo facilitated a design charrette to gather input on how the project could address community needs, i.e. long-term affordability, pedestrian safety, active transit connectivity, and a plan for community and continued community engagement while adhering to the ASIC program goals. The project team met weekly with public works and community development departments. SAMTRANS also joined these discussions to help integrate the bus project. So let me just recap that case study. So that was a really good example of where all the public partners came together and really made, and made this a successful application. And now I'll talk about some lessons learned. So based on some of these case studies of examples of awarded projects, it's important to remember that you work across housing and transportation sectors to identify shared goals. That's number one. Secondly, you want to identify planned projects that are a priority for both the local jurisdiction and the housing developer and the community and that have funding to leverage. And then lastly, but most importantly, it's important that you really establish regular communication through weekly calls, for example. Okay, now I'm going to share some Q&A, Q um, sorry, I'm going to go into actually the timeline and then end this presentation by uh, responding to any chat box questions that haven't been responded to. So let's give you all an overview of the ASIC timeline. 
So as you can see on this slide, this is uh, the annual cycle for ASIC. So when we look at round six, for example, we'll use this. So the draft ASIC guidelines will come out at around late August. And then there is a comment period between that and then October when the final guidelines are actually adopted. You'll note that shortly thereafter, the NOFA is released typically in early November. And so from that period on until February is the full application uh, period. And the applications are due around early to mid-February with awards in June. You'll note that there is a time period between February and June, and this consists of appeal periods for both the thresholds and also for your initial score. So factor those into the time period between February and June when the awards are announced. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into the timeline and how it actually could be applied to you as public partners and applicants on an ASIC application. So keep in mind that these are recommendations, these are ideal timelines, and it's never frankly too early to start on an application. So using round six as an example. So let's just say that you're interested in applying. You want to obviously make sure that you meet all the thresholds, and then you want to start engaging with the public partners the housing developer, transit agencies, and start developing your scope around now to early summer. And this, this doesn't mean finalizing those elements, but really beginning to brainstorm and have a long list of possible ideas. So throughout that period, you want to also start prepping for in community engagement, which ideally should happen no later than the fall. And you want to make sure you're engaging with partners and using these community engagement meetings to further refine the scope as well. And then from the fall until early winter, you wanna make sure that you're making moves to finalize your budget and the scope with your public partners and transit agency. And then finally, it's really important to keep in mind that the most intense time period on an ASIC application cycle is going to be the January to February timeline. When you're completing your application, including the narrative, and you're gathering your GHG inputs with the transit partners and collecting all the attachments that need to be uploaded. And then, as I said previously, after you submit in February, there'll be appeal periods in April and May leading up to the June awards. So this is a, a theoretical example of how, what you should be doing to apply for a round six or later application round. Okay, so this is rounding out this presentation, but here are some next steps that you as uh, potential applicants should consider. So one of them is that if you are an eligible TA recipient and you should consider applying for free TA from the state. And just a little bit about that. So typically the state will send out a questionnaire to interested parties in the fall period. Uh, you will fill that out and based on criteria established by the state, you can be determined to be a TA recipient. And again, that is free technical assistance that's available to you. Alternatively, you can also contract with a private fee-for-service T provider like Enterprise or others. And then as I said during the timeline slide, it's never too early to start working on an ASIC application. So now is a good time to start preparing for round six. So I'm gonna end this presentation by sharing our contact information. So uh, you'll note here on this slide that the Enterprise ASIC TA team consists of Julia, myself, and Christine. And Julia is responsible for projects in the Bay Area. I'm responsible for projects in Southern California. And Christine is responsible for projects in all other regions. So if you do have specific projects in mind and wanna chat about them, uh, feel free to contact us through our emails on this slide and just choose the correct point person for your specific region. And then finally, I'll note before turning it over to the chat that a representative from SGC, Shep, his contact information is also here. So if you do have any general questions regarding AHSC, please feel free to reach, reach out to SGC. And as part of our Q&A tracker that we'll send out to you after this, including the webinar and the slides, will be a URL where you can actually sign up for the state's questionnaire that I mentioned earlier, where you can 
fill that out to see if you'd be eligible for the state's free TA, as well as get all the state's uh, announcements on the ASIC program. So with that, I want to thank you so much for joining today's webinar, and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Julia, if she has any opportunities to discuss any unanswered chat questions that have arisen during the presentation. So thanks everyone so much, and now we'll look at some of your unan unanswered chat questions. Thanks, Alejandro. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so I have two questions um, so far that um, I thought we'd save for the Q&A portion. Um, so the first one is, um, I'll just read some of the question. It says, one of the requirements from past rounds was the requirement for public partners to be liable for the entire project, not just, in, uh, not just the public improvements. And um, th this makes it difficult for public agencies to participate as a joint applicant since they may not want to be on the hook for developing the housing portion of the grant if the developer is unable to complete the project. Has SGC discussed amending this so more public agencies can fully participate in a joint application? That's a great question, and I can take a stab at it. And obviously, um, Christine or Jill, if you want to add in here. So, you know, this has been addressed in the guidelines in the sense that you um, can now, it explicitly states in the guidelines that you can side, you can sign side, side agreements, um, cross indemnification with cross indemnification clauses that would address that concern. That is obviously something that public partners have to think about and historically, while that might have been a challenge, I believe the language in the ASIC guidelines makes it very clear that you can cross indemnify each other through these side agreements. And in fact, as a as a result of that, we've seen many successful examples of public partners definitely signing on as joint applicants and not having an issue with that. So I think that will that addresses that concern. But as I said earlier, if you do have any further questions about that, feel free to reach out to us and we can give you the actual guideline section that uh, states that explicitly. Hi all, this is Christine. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll also note that was a change made, I believe in round three of the program and it has led to increased participation and um, you know, more geographical representation across the state from applicants. Thanks Christine, I could hear you fine. And thanks, Julia, for reading the question. Sure. So the next question I have here is, um, it's saying, I'm concerned about the impact of COVID and lack delays on delivery of projects within the timelines in the grants. Are there any COVID-related extensions under consideration? Um, and I haven't necessarily heard of anything, so I'm wondering if um, Alejandra and Christine, you, you have. So I believe the state, um, you know, we're all kind of adapting right now for projects that received previous awards. If you anticipate running into a timing issue for implementing any of the proposed scope that, that were in those applications, would certainly recommend reaching out to SGC and HCD with your concerns. Um, if you need contact information, we're happy to provide that. For projects moving forward, uh, I think this is an ongoing conversation with the state, um, and we can certainly, you know, raise delivery timelines up as an item that potential applicants are concerned about. But there has been no formal guidance issued as of yet. Um, again, as Alejandro mentioned, delivery timelines are articulated explicitly in the standard agreement, which you would sign after receiving an award. That's right, and um, just to also remind everyone, there is that that time period that I mentioned, which is for the housing at least no more than five years after that, and then the transit pieces usually fall within that. So, so keep that in mind, you know, that there is this longer term horizon there. Okay, thanks, Julia. Any other questions that popped up? Yeah, so there's one more question, and then there's one more clarification. I've been sort of putting in the range of um, winning applications from round four in response to, to a question that was asked earlier. And um, at first there was a typo, but now I'm also just uh, realizing that um, the second answer I provided was also wrong. So I just wanna clarify that. Uh, so the, 
the top scoring application in round four was actually 89, not 86. Um, so for ICP and TOD projects, the range was actually 72 to 89. And then there is a rural project that was being awarded at 67 total points. Okay, and then the last question that we have here, and I'm just gonna read it out loud, um, Alejandro. It's uh, projects outside of the central business district are usually ones cited zoned for lower density, yet transit improvements outside of the central business district will typically result in greater VMT and GHG reductions. Density is one of the highest point opportunities for the housing component. Are considerations being given to adjust for density based on GHG reductions? So there's a couple of things here to mention. One of them is that the GHG quantification is strictly dictated by a calculator. And on that calculator, it does explicitly look at the density of the housing, um, not the density of the population. And so that's, it, and the, the calculator is pretty black and white about that there, unless the, the state will entertain changes to the calculator and, and include these other types of measurements like housing uh, population density or rather, that's something that's unfortunately not quantifiable. And now, you know, the definitely we do understand that being located out of a, a central business district or CBD um, is something to consider. However, um, and then maybe if Christine wants to say something about this, we have seen many examples of successful projects, especially in the RIPA category there, that are well outside of the CBD and are still able to propose substantial transit components that are able to achieve GHG reductions. And so in that sense, they're able to quote unquote, make up for the fact that they're not within or near a central business district. So with that, uh, Christine, do you wanna mention anything else? Sure, and apologies if there's some background noise or some construction near me. Um, I'll just mention whether you're in a CBD or not, it doesn't have a direct point allocation, but it does contribute to the GHG score. Um, somewhat minimally is my understanding, so it's not a huge detriment if your project site is not explicitly within a central business district. Uh, density in the same way does not have a direct point allocation, but plays into your GHG reduction potential. Um, and those are kind of weighed somewhat separately. Um, so you, you should still maximize density to the extent you can, regardless of whether you are in a CDB. Um, and we can certainly look at your sites individually and can do it through a case-by-case -case basis of what will make you more competitive. Okay, and thanks, Christine, and sorry for the background noise construction. Okay, Julia, anything we might have missed or you want to seek further clarification on? No, I think no. that's that's it. There are no more questions, but maybe we can, you know, we have four more minutes. Maybe we can kind of just stay on the line and then if more questions come in, we can answer them. That sounds great. So we'll give everyone three minutes. If you want to put any last minute questions into the chat box, we'll entertain them. And as I said, thanks everyone for joining and feel free to contact us individually afterwards and we'll send you the presentation the webinar recording and uh definitely the contact for the listserv so you could sign up for any sgc updates and i do see a question here about how can one access the application for the free ta so when we send you this follow-up email we'll send you the listserv to sign on to which will and then the state essentially will send out a questionnaire later on during the year uh, the questionnaire consists of specific questions that will help the state determine uh, who is eligible to receive the free ta so that that answers that question so thanks michelle uh, and some people have questions about community engagement varying due to COVID-19. So um, I think the state is, does not have an um, official response as to, to that question right now. 
However, it's important to be creative and even in this COVID time period to reach out to hard to reach partners. I will say I was just on a call just to give you an example of folks who are doing focused Zoom call meetings with small groups. And so that's one example where in, 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 in a way, because you can't meet in large groups, you can still have some of these more targeted calls using a virtual communication. And definitely be aware that you can't default though to kind of internet survey types of engagement. I think it's more relevant to try to do this Zoom type of or other type of Google Hangout type of conversations for community engagement. So thanks for that question. And we'll obviously we'll continue to track this. Yeah, and, and also just a reminder that we will have a webinar on June 18th, sorry, June 16th. Um, focused on community engagement where more questions like this might come up and will be addressed. So we will also download this chat um, from this conversation and make sure to include it as part of that Q&A so that any questions that you've had will be memorialized. And so everyone will be able to get this, this a script of these questions that have been asked. All right, well, we'll give it one more minute and then we'll log off. All right. Well, thanks everyone again for joining. So we will. Oh, one last question <laughs> really quickly. Any thoughts on aligning timing between transit and housing projects and flexibility lessons learned? Uh, so really quickly, I think for both transit and housing, you know, the, the name of the game is that you have quote unquote shovel ready projects. So as I said in the lessons learned slide, you want to look at projects that have already been identified for housing. You want to look at things that have been approved or will be approved in, in a short while, given the timeline for ASIC application deadlines. And for the transit, ideally, the transit agency will have already had some sort of adopted plan for a component and are, merely, and are seeking a leveraged gap financing, sorry, gap financing to fill in a hole. So rather than reinvent the wheel, you really just already defer to something that's existing and go ahead and use ASIC to help complement that. Thanks for the question, Craig. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Take care, bye.